this example, we're going to go through the whole process of running and interpreting regressions using R. And we're going to start by creating an R Studio project and then importing data and then analyzing that data. Um, and then um, we'll finish by making a complete R Markdown file um, with all of the code and analysis and graphics and everything in a single document. Um, so if you go ahead and open R Studio and download the um, R Markdown file in the data set from the website, um, we can go ahead and get started. So let's switch over to R Studio. Um, you should see a screen that looks like this. A couple important things to pay attention to before we start doing anything is we care a lot about where R is pointed at, what files it can see on our computer. Um, right now, if you look right under the console, you have this tilde sign. That means it's pointed at my home directory, which on a Mac is the same directory that has your desktop and your documents folder and your music folder and all of that stuff. On Windows, it has the same thing. Um, that's not necessarily where we want R to be pointed at. We want it um, generally pointed at a specific folder that's on our computer. Um, we call those projects with RStudio. Um, if you look up in the top corner here, you'll see that there's no current project. Um, again, that just means RStudio is not pointed at any specific directory. So we're going to make a new project and have RStudio point at that folder, and then everything that we do is going to be based on that folder. Um, so to do that, we can go to File, New Project, and we wait for the menu to come up here. Um, we're going to create a new project using a new directory. We could do existing directory if we had a folder on our computer that was empty and had like that's where we want to have all of our stuff happen. Um, if we choose new directory, R will create a brand new empty directory for us and then start putting stuff in it. Um, so we'll just say new directory. We're going to create a new project and we're going to put it on the desktop here and we'll just call this regression. So this is going to create a new directory called regression on my desktop. Um, and it should switch our studio to point at that directory. So if I hit OK and wait for just a second here, it's going to switch our studio to that. OK, so if you look in the top corner now, it says regression. And that's the name of the project. But more importantly, if you look here in the console tab, it says that this is currently pointed at desktop slash regression. And if we look at the desktop, you'll see that there's a brand new folder here called regression. And in there, you have this file called regression.rproj. That's a special R project file. If I double clicked on that, it would open R Studio immediately, point it at this folder, and that's where everything is going to happen. Um, so that's what we want to have happen. So based on this project folder, this is where we're going to put our data. This is where we're going to put the scripts that we write and the code that we write. That's all going to be in here, just so everything is self-contained. It's really nice because if I move this folder somewhere else, um, I don't need to update any of the paths. Um, it will just know because everything is relative to this project file right here. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a data set in here that I've downloaded from the website. I'm going to create a new folder. And I'll call it data. You can call it whatever you want. It doesn't matter. You don't even need to make a separate folder for this. Um, I just like to have separate folders for data and for output and for other things just for the sake of organization. Again, you don't have to do that. You could just put the data set directly here in the regression folder. That's fine. Um, so I'm going to make this new folder called data. And I'm going to put stuff in it um, from downloads from this file here. I'm going to put this SAT GPA data set into data here. So all I did was just drag it in there. Again, none of this is R based. I haven't done anything with R except make a new project. Um, this is just putting stuff in folders. So um, hopefully not too complicated. You've seen stuff like this before. You move files around on your computer all the time. OK, so we can come back to our studio now that we have our data in a folder somewhere. Um, we can see it here um, if we refresh this picture here. Oh, it's there. We have two data folders there. But if we look in there, we have SAT GPA. It's there. You can navigate throughout the, the project here in the Files panel if you want. Um, so we're going to create a new R Markdown file um, where we're going to do all of our coding and our analysis. We're going to say File, New, R Markdown. What I generally like to do is just have an empty R Markdown file. I don't try to rename it or anything um, because you can just type the, the title here. We're going to call this regression. Um, we can put my name here, sure. You can put whatever you want there. 
Um, so this top section here, this is the metadata about the document. So the document's title, author, date, stuff like that. Um, everything after this section that ends with this triple dash thing here, everything after here is either text or code. Code is going to be in these triple backtick sections that have this R here. That means this is R code that's going to run. Everything that's not in a triple backtick section is just text. Um, so this is just text that you type. Um, you can format it. If you want it to be bold, you use two asterisks. If you want it to be italic, you use one asterisk around things. These two pound signs here mean that that's a second level heading. If this just had one, that'd be a first level heading. If it had three, that'd be a third level heading. You can go up to six if you really, really want. That's going to be a complicated document with uh, six level subsections. Um, so what I generally do is I make a brand new R Markdown file. I select from the bottom of the metadata section, so like line seven here. I select all the way to the bottom and delete. Um, just so I have an empty R Markdown file ready for me to start typing in. Um, so if I save this document, if I click on save right here, or press Command S or Control S, that will save the document. And we'll just call this whatever we want. Generally, you don't want to use spaces here. Um, R doesn't like files with spaces, and so general best practice is to not use spaces. So we'll just call this fun regression stuff. Okay, so everything we type is going to be in this fun regression stuff stuff.rmd file, which you can see here in the files pane. If we go back to our desktop, um, we can see that file here. It's showing up there. Everything that we type is in there. So that's good. Okay, so what we want to do at first is we want to load the data into our studio so we can start doing stuff with it. So that means we need to run some R code. Um, so to do that, we need a chunk to put that code in and then we can run it. So if I click on this menu here and say insert R chunk, it will automatically type the triple back ticks and this brace thing and the R thing for you. So you don't have to type it by hand. It's really tedious to type by hand. You can also do it with a keyboard shortcut. If you're on a Mac, you can press command option I. If you're on Windows, you can do Control Alt I, and it'll do the same thing. It'll insert an empty chunk for you. Um, so we have our chunk here. We're going to, at the very first thing we do in pretty much any R script is we need to load the packages that we care about using. Um, and for the sake of this class, we're always going to load the tidyverse package because it has a whole bunch of packages that all work together, like ggplot for plotting things, um, like dplyr for manipulating data sets and other things. So we're going to say library, spell it correctly, library, tidyverse. So we're going to load the tidyverse library here. Um, so far, nothing's actually been loaded. All we've done is type something. Um, but we haven't run anything. Um, to actually run this, you're going to click on this green button, which will run that chunk. Um, you can also run the whole chunk if you have your cursor in there somewhere and you press Command, Shift, Enter. That, that's the same as hitting the, the play button there, or Control, Shift, Enter if you're in Windows. So we're going to run that line there. And now it has loaded Tidyverse. And it'll show a whole bunch of messages. That's neat. Um, Tidyverse is a very talkative package. It just says it is loading all of these other packages. Um, that's helpful information, but if I knit this document right now, like if I click on this knit button and we convert this document to HTML, what that's going to do is go through and load all or run all of the chunks and then convert it into a nice HTML file that is nicely formatted. And you'll notice that it has all of these messages and warnings here in the document. And we don't want that. That's just kind of extra stuff. So I want to get rid of that stuff. Um, to do that, if you click on this little gear icon in the top corner of that chunk, you can tell it to not show warnings and to not show messages. And if we apply, um, now you see in the chunk options here, it says message equals false, warning equals false. And so now it won't actually show anything out of this chunk if there's a warning or a message. So if we knit now, it will run and do all of the chunks in the document, which is just one. And it should open up the HTML file here, and it should just be library tidyverse. So it actually ran. You just don't see all of the extra junk that happens after you run it. OK, we also want to load our data. Um, so we have a data set here. We 
called SAT GPA, we need to put that into R. So the way we're going to do that is we're going to use the read CSV function. So read underscore CSV, and then we want to type the path to that data file. So if we use quotes here, we can actually type the directory here. It's going to be data slash, and R is actually smart enough. If you hit tab, it will autocomplete. That only works because there's one file in there. If there were multiple files in there, it would show kind of a, a menu on your screen, so you could choose different um, files. Um, just that saves on typing. Okay, so if I run this line right now by itself, it will read that CSV file into R, but it won't actually let me do any, anything with it. It's not going to store it as an object that I can then manipulate or put into a model or plot or do anything. Um, so what I want to do is at the very beginning of this line where it says read CSV, I want to save it as something. I want to store it as an object. Um, you can name it whatever. We could name it ASDF. We could name it dog. We could name it whatever we want. In this case, I'm just going to name it SAT underscore GPA, which is the name of the file. It doesn't have to be the name of the file. That's just what I put here. And then we're going to use this backwards arrow um, assignment operator here, this less than sign and minus. That's R's way of saying, take this read CSV function, whatever it's doing, and store the output of it in SAT GPA here. Um, if you don't want to type that, um, because that's a lot of keystrokes, um, in our studio, if you press option minus or alt minus, it will insert that backwards arrow for you. Okay, so now if I run this chunk, it's going to load tidyverse, and then it's going to um, make a new object called SAT GPA based on that data set we have. And if you look in your environment panel, you can actually see that. We have a new thing called SAT GPA. And if I click on it, I can see it has a whole bunch of columns in there, um, a column for sex, SAT verbal and math and total scores, high school GPA and freshman year GPA, a whole bunch of stuff in there. And you can scroll through and see all sorts of stuff. You could sort by high school GPA, look at the lowest GPA, look at the highest, there's a 4.5. Um, you can see a whole bunch of stuff in there. So that's neat. Um, so we have our first chunk. And if we knit the document now, we wouldn't really see anything because all we're doing in this analysis is loading a library and loading data in, and that's all. So we want to answer some specific questions about this data, um, which I've, I have in a separate document here. I'm going to move into this document here. So we're going to paste this here. Um, if you notice, there are a whole bunch of different headings. There's this first level heading called exploratory questions, and then second level headings with each of the questions that we're concerned about. Um, the correlation between SAT scores and freshman GPA, correlation between high school GPA and freshman GPA, other things like that. And then if we come down to models, then we're going to predict freshman GPA using a whole bunch of different things, using high school GPA, using SAT scores, other things like that. Um, and so this is just kind of what we're going to be trying to do here, checking some correlations, running some regressions to answer these questions. Um, the nice thing about using these headings is we have a little table of contents here. If I click on this um, bottom section here with the, the orange pound sign, um, you can actually see a table of contents of the document based on the headings that we have. And if you click on one of these, it will take you down to that section. So this is really helpful if you have a longer document and you need to navigate around. You can go back up to the beginning. Um, you can go down to the end. You can jump around throughout the document, which is helpful. OK, also, if we knit this document now, let's see what it looks like. Um, it's going to load Tidyverse. It's going to load the, the SAT GPA data, but that's all it's going to do. But it will also include all of the text with the headings. And so it should look like that. So we have our bigger exploratory questions, and then we have our sm the actual questions here as second level headings. Um, one fun thing we can do is we can actually make it so that, that HTML file, or if we're knitting to PDF, the PDF file, or in Word, um, has a table of contents built into it automatically. So if you come up to this um, gear icon next to the knit button here, you can go to output options, and we're going to say for HTML output, we want to include a table of contents. So we're going to check that box and hit OK. And you'll notice this metadata now is a little bit different. It says if we're doing HTML output, then we're going to say yes to the table of contents. So that's going to include a table of contents for our HTML output. So if I knit now, it will run all of our code. 
So it's loading that data again, not doing anything with it, just loading it. And here is our document. And notice that how, how it has a table of contents now. So in our knitted document, we can jump down to this section here, which is the bottom. There's nothing under it because we haven't done anything, but um, we have a cool table of contents for navigating. So that's neat. Um, so let's go ahead and answer some of these questions. Um, the first thing we want to do is um, see what the correlation is between SAT scores and freshman GPA. So we have two columns here. We have SAT scores, SAT total, and freshman GPA. So we want to see how closely correlated those are. Um, to do that using R, there's a function called COR, or core, for correlation. So we're going to come into this section here, how well do SAT scores correlate with freshman GPA. We're going to insert a new chunk so we can run some R code. So we're going to click on Insert, R chunk, or you can press Command Option I or Control Alt I. And we are going to run some R code here. So we're going to use the correlation function, or COR, and then open parentheses. So to do this, we have to feed it two variable names, um, or two columns that we want it to correlate. Um, to do this, the columns are inside our data set here. So we want, if we look back at our data set, we want SAT total, and we want freshman year GPA. So if we type the name of our data set, SAT, or SAT, T underscore GPA, and then press dollar sign. That is the way that we can tell um, tell our what specific column we want to use in that SAT GPA data set. So we want, um, what was it, freshman GPA. Then we want to do comma, because we want the correlation between freshman GPA and SAT GPA, dollar sign. And what was the other thing we wanted? SAT total right there. Okay, so if I run this chunk, it shows the correlation. Correlation is 0.46, which means it's positive, and that's fairly strong. It's not one, that would be perfectly correlated. It's not zero, that means no correlation at all. And it's not negative, meaning as freshman GPA goes higher, SAT goes lower. Um, this shows that they move together, and that's fairly well correlated. We have the correlation there. Neat. Um, we can visualize that if we plot both of those things. Um, so we're going to insert a new chunk here. I'm going to say insert R chunk. So we're going to use ggplot like you learned about in your um, our studio primers here. And we're going to plot those two columns using geom point um, to plot them as points, like a scatter plot. So we're going to say our data set equals SAT GPA. And then we have to tell it the mapping. We have to say, what do we want on the x-axis? What do we want on the y-axis? Which of these columns do we want mapped onto which part of the graph? So we're going to say mapping equals AES. So the AES function lets us map columns to parts of the graph. We're going to say x equals S, uh, GPA underscore FY. Y equals SAT total. If we run this now, we will see a graph with nothing, um, except it did put freshman GPA on the x-axis and it put SAT total on the y-axis, so that's good. Um, the reason we don't see anything is because we didn't tell ggplot how to actually put the graphic on the plot. To do that, we have to use a geom layer, which is how we actually show the x and y um, variables there. So if we say geom point, that's going to put dots. So if we run this chunk now, we should see a scatter plot of freshman GPA and SAT total. Neat. They do move together. They go up. Um, so as freshman GPA increases, your SAT score increases. Um, we can add a second geom layer if we want. We can add a line to see how well, or to see what the actual trend looks like. So to do that, we're going to say geom smooth. Um, if we run that, we should get kind of a curvy line. It's not going to be perfectly straight. It's going to try to fit the data the best possible, so it's kind of the smooth line like that. If we want it to be a nice straight line, like if it was using OLS, we can actually tell it to use a linear model instead of this curvy model here. So in geom smooth, we can say method equals, in quotes, LM for linear model. So what that's going to do is add a smooth line, but it's really just going to be a straight line using a linear model. And there's the relationship between SAT and freshman GPA. Neat. 
If we wanted to be extra fancy, we could add another layer here to change the labels, which is labs. So right now the y axis is like SAT underscore total, but that's kind of ugly. So we can say y equals, and then in quotes, we can say total SAT score. And then x is kind of ugly too right now. It just says GPA underscore FY. So we're going to say x equals, and then quotes, freshman GPA. So if we run this chunk now, we should get a much nicer graph. Freshman GPA, total SAT score. We've got dots. We've got a line. Neat. Um, just to see what it looks like, what I like to do often while I'm doing this analysis is I will knit. Um, which will start back up at the beginning, run the or load the data, um, do all of the analysis we've done, and stick it in a document um, to see what we have. So let's see what this looks like after knitting. We should get an HTML file that pops up. And if we scroll down, here's our exploratory questions. How well do SAT scores correlate with freshman GPA? 0.46. Here's a picture of it. Neat. Um, in real life, we could actually like have a paragraph here explaining like, I think SAT scores correlate with freshman GPA because of all these previous studies, blah, blah, blah. Here's the actual correlation and then show the code to do it. And then we say, have a paragraph saying, I want to plot this. And so here is a plot and then have the code that shows the plot. So that's how you can kind of integrate the actual text and the interpretation and the explanation with the code and the output all at the same time, which is really neat and really powerful. Um, so let's move on to the next question. How well does high school GPA correlate with freshman GPA? Um, so we want the correlation between high school GPA and freshman GPA. So we're going to insert a new chunk because we're going to use R to do this. We're going to use the correlation function, C-O-R. Um, this is really, really similar to the previous question, which was um, correlation between freshman GPA and SAT total. So I can actually just copy this line here and come down to our empty chunk and paste it because I don't want to retype all of that. Um, the question is high school GPA and freshman GPA. So we have freshman GPA. We need high school GPA instead of SAT. So the name of high school GPA was GPA underscore HS. So if we just change this to GPA underscore HS and now run correlation, they're correlated at 0.54. Neat. Um, we can plot that by just copying this code here that we had for SAT and freshman GP or yeah SAT and freshman GPA. We're just going to change a couple things. So I'm going to copy that chunk, come and put it here. Um, X-axis is still going to be freshman GPA, um, but Y-axis or Y-axis is going to be high school GPA. So we're going to switch that. Um, we can change the label here to high school GPA. Now, if I run this chunk, we should get a cool scatter plot that looks like that. So as your freshman GPA goes up, your high school GPA goes up, probably want to reverse those story-wise um, because high school comes first. So we're going to call Y the freshman GPA and X the high school GPA. So we're just reversing those here. So X is high school GPA. So now if we run it, what this is showing is as your high school GPA goes up, your predicted freshman GPA is also going to go up. So if you got high scores in high school, you're probably going to get high scores in college is what that's showing. Neat. Okay, this question here. Is the correlation between SAT scores um, higher or lower um, for men or for women? So to do this, what we want is a correlation score. We have the correlation between SAT scores and freshman GPA. That's right here, freshman, or yeah, nope, that was up this very first one. Freshman GPA and SAT scores. So this is the overall correlation, this 0.46, but we want to know what that correlation is for men and for women. So we want to do two different correlations on different subsets of the data. So to do this, it's actually a lot easier, like we could like make a filtered version of SAT GPA that's just males, and then... Um, calculate the correlation and then make another data set that's just women and calculate the correlation. But that's a whole bunch of extra steps. So what we're going to do instead is use dplyr um, and group by and summarize, which you had practice with in your um, our studio primers. So we're going to insert a new chunk here. What we're going to do is we're going to take the SAT 
GPA dataset, and we're going to do a whole bunch of different functions to it. And so rather than, um, so before we had like COR, and then if we wanna do another function to it, we would have that wrapped around, so like another correlation. So you're gonna have a whole bunch of parentheses all stacked up inside each other, and that it's gonna get really confusing. So to get around that, we're going to use the pipe sign, which is this percent greater than percent symbol. And so what that means is we're going to take this SAT GPA data set and we're going to feed it into the function that comes after. And then we're going to feed that into the next function and so on. Um, so if you don't want to type percent greater than percent, um, you can do command shift M on a Mac or control shift M on Windows and it'll insert it for you. Um, so we're going to say SAT GPA, we're going to group by one of the columns. We're going to group by the column that is called sex. So what that is going to do is it's going to split our data set into invisible data sets behind the scenes, one for male and one for female. And then we're going to summarize um, and calculate something on both of those invisible data sets. So to do that, we're going to add another pipe. And we're going to say summarize. We're going to make a new column for each of these summarized data sets called correlation. And that's going to be equal to the COR function. So we want the correlation between SAT total and GPA freshman year. So if I run this now, that's going to calculate this correlation inside each of these groups. So if I run it, there we go. So for females, for women, the correlation is 0.49. For men, the correlation is 0.48. Um, so not a huge difference there, but we could calculate it. Um, so then we have this question here. Is the correlation between high school GPA and freshman GPA stronger for men or for women? We can calculate the same thing using this code. We just have to change one thing. Um, so we'll go ahead and copy this whole chunk here, put it down here. And the question now is high school GPA and freshman GPA. So we have freshman GPA, we need high school GPA, which uh, the column name is GPA underscore HS. So we can say GPA underscore HS. If we run that, there we go. So the correlation between high school GPA and freshman GPA is pretty strong for women. It's 0 0.59. It's 0 0.48 for men. Um, so that's probably a pretty big difference there. Um, so I would predict that high school GPA is more predictive of freshman GPA for women than it is for men based on this super simple correlation here. But now we have that, that difference between the two groups. Um, based, like we just grouped by sex and then made a, a column called correlation here that does the correlation, but it's for each of those groups. If we knit the document now, just to check to see how it's going, it's going to start from scratch, go to the very top, load the data, um, make all of the plots, do all of the calculations, and stick it all together in a document. Um, so it's thinking about it, and it should show up right now. There we go. So we have some exploratory questions. How well do SAT scores correlate for, with freshman GPA? We've got a correlation, we've got a plot, um, we've got more correlations, more plots. We've got grouped correlations, which is neat. If we want grouped plots, um, the magical part of ggplot is if we want to incorporate one of the other columns that we have um, into the plot, like if we want sex to be in this plot, we could color each of these points by sex. So some of these points would be one color and some would be another based on male or female. Um, to do that, we just have to add one aesthetic. So we'll come to one of these plots here. We can shrink this down a little bit. Um, so here with our SAT GPA freshman and high school GPA, what we're gonna do is come here and say color equals sex. So we're gonna take that sex column and map it onto the points and the line. So if we run this now, we should get a whole bunch of different colored points and different colored lines. So you can see the, the effect uh, or the relationship between high school GPA and freshman GPA for women and for men, and you can see which points are women and which points are men, and that's pretty cool. Okay, so we've done correlation. Now we need to do regression. 
Um, so we have these different models here that we want to um, run to, to answer these questions. Do SAT scores predict freshman GPA? So if we think about this, our x variable, um, we can actually just type this in regular text here. So our x is going to be SAT scores. So do these things predict our outcome? So our outcome is going to be freshman GPA. Okay. If I want these to be in a list when it knits, like a nice bulleted list, I can use an asterisk um, or I can use a dash. So I can say like that, that's going to turn into a nice list. So x equals SAT scores, y equals freshman GPA. Um, so we need to insert a new chunk so we can actually run this model. So we're going to insert an R chunk. And here we go. We're going to make a new, we're going to use LM here to run a linear model. We're going to use the formula that we talked about, the formula system that we talked about in the lecture for session two, where we have Y is explained by X. So that tilde is the, the key that's right next to your number one on your keyboard. You press shift and then do that tilde thing. So that means that's our um, dependent variable, that's our independent variable. So Y is explained by X. We don't actually use Y and X here, we use the name of the column. So in this case, Y is freshman GPA. So if we look back at our data set, that's GPA underscore FY. So we're gonna say GPA underscore FY. Our X is SAT scores, which is SAT total. So we come here and say SAT underscore total. And then the last thing we have to do is tell this function what data set to look in and that is SAT GPA. Okay, if I run this, it will run the model and it'll show the results immediately right here on the screen, but I can't really do anything with it. I can't um, investigate it. I can't see what the R squared is. I can't see any of the p-values or the standard errors or anything. Um, it, just, it just showed the output immediately on the screen. So what I wanna do instead is store the results of this model as an object. Um, and then we can do stuff with it. So at the beginning, I'm just gonna call this model underscore simple. You can really call it whatever you want. You can call it cat, it doesn't matter. So we're gonna say model simple, and then we're gonna use this assign key, the backwards arrow thing, which is again, alt minus or option minus. And so now if I run it, nothing shows up. Um, we do have a new object over here in the environment panel called model simple, it's there but we can't actually see anything about the model here. Um, if I knit the document, it would show the code here and it makes an object called model simple, but we can't see any of the coefficients, we can't see any of the p-values, we can't see anything. Um, so we can either, if you use the summary function, and we say summary model simple, if I run this chunk, now we can see all of the details about this model. We can see the actual coefficient. We can see the y-intercept. We can see the p-value, basically zero. Um, we can see the r-squared. We can see a whole bunch of stuff here. But this is really ugly. If you knit this document, this whole chunk of like text would show up in your document, and that's like awful. Um, so what, and then like, if you want to plot one of these things later, like plot the actual coefficient, there's no easy way of extracting that single number from all of this text. So instead, what I like to do is instead of using summary, I like to use a function called tidy, which converts this model into a data set. And then you can do regular data set things with it, like mutate and filter and summarize and other things like that. Um, the tidy function, is not built into R normally. You have to load a package called broom. It's inside the broom package. So if I scroll back up to the top here, so after I load library tidyverse, I'm going to say library broom. Um, so if I run this chunk again, it's going to now load the broom library. Um, so now if I come back down to where I was with the model here, Rather than say summary model simple, we're going to say tidy model simple. So if I run it now, you'll notice that instead of having this big wall of text, if it'll run, um, it'll have a nice table here where we have our the, the terms, the estimate, the standard error, statistics. If you click on this, it shows you the p-value. Um, if you want confidence intervals, um, which is often helpful if you wanna see what the range of the estimate is, um, that's an argument in tidy. You can say tidy model simple comma conf 
dot int equals true. So now if I run it, it should show the same table, but it has a couple new columns for confidence low and confidence high. So neat. Um, so there's our, our details of the model. If we want to know the R squared for the model or the F statistic or any other of the model diagnostics, the function for that is glance. We're going to glance at the model details. So we're going to say glance model underscore simple. So if I run this now, it shows two different um, tables. Here's the first one that has the coefficients, and here's the second one that has R squared. So an R squared of 0.2. Um, which is pretty low. R squared of 1 means it perfectly explains the outcome. Um, R squared of 0.2 means 20, or 21% of the variation in freshman GPA is explained by SAT scores. So not a ton, um, but we have that number there. Um, so now we can interpret these things. Um, again, this is just a, a line. Um, we've actually already seen the picture of it if we come up here to this first picture. So showing that as freshman Actually, this is reversed. Um, our y here is going to be um, SAT score. Um, yeah, so we want freshman GPA and y. So let's actually copy this plot, and we'll do it the right way. So we're going to copy this whole chunk here and come down to our model. because so we want to visualize this model here. So we're going to paste it. So our data is still SAT GPA, but we want what we've written here. We want x to be SAT scores and y to be freshman GPA. So we want x to be SAT scores and y to be freshman GPA. We'll switch the labels down here. So x equals SAT score, y equals freshman GPA. So now if we run it, this should show the same details that's in the regression um, results here. So what this is showing is for every one point increase in your SAT score, your GPA has an associated increase of 0.02. Um, so if you're moving from 75 to 76, your GPA is going to go from, if it was at 2, it's going to go to 2.02. Um, and so that that's what that estimate is showing there. Um, the intercept just means if you extrapolated this all the way down to 0, it's going to cross the y-axis at um, basically 0, 0.0019. And so that's where it's going to start. And then it's going to increase um, basically up 0.2 over 1, up 0.2 over 1. And that's the slope. Um, and that's the model we have. OK, so next, does a certain type of SAT score have a larger effect on freshman GPAs? Um, if you notice in the data set, we have total GPA or total SAT, but we also have SAT scores for verbal and for math. So we want to see if one of these has a bigger effect on your freshman GPA than the other. So to do that, we'll include both of those variables in a regression model. Um, to save on typing, I'm actually just going to copy this whole chunk that has the model simple in it. So we'll copy it. We'll come down to this question here, paste. So rather than call this model simple, we'll call this model SAT. Um, and so we're going to explain freshman GPA not using SAT total anymore. We're going to use SAT verbal plus SAT math. So SAT verbal plus SAT math, but actually spell it correctly instead of sta, S-A-T. Um, if I ran this right now, it would show model results, but it wouldn't actually show the results for model SAT. Um, if you notice, tidy still says model simple. So it will show the results from the previous chunk, which we don't want. We want the model SAT. So I'm just going to copy that and replace these things there. So it should show the results for model SAT. So if I run that, um, we can look at this first um, data set here. So the estimate for SAT verbal is 0 0.25. The estimate for SAT math is 0.2. Two. Um, so it doesn't look like there's a huge difference. What that means is for every one point increase in your verbal SAT score, your GPA in your freshman year is going to go up by 0 0.02. Um, and for every one point increase in your SAT math score, it's also going to go up by 0 0.12, holding things constant. So if you remember the switch and slider analogy that we used in the lecture, this just means we're going to hold verbal constant and move math up. 
um, or hold math constant and move verbal up and down and see what happens to GPA as you bump verbal up or bump it down. And so that's what the model results are showing there. Um, let's go to the next one. Do high school GPAs protect, predict freshman GPAs? So the question here, we still our Y is still freshman GPA, but now our X is high school GPA. So we can actually just copy the same code because we don't want to retype it all. Um, but now the code is no longer freshman GPA explained by SAT scores. We're doing freshman GPA explained by high school GPA, which I forgot the name of the column, GPA underscore HS. So GPA underscore HS. Um, we'll name this model model HS. And then we'll update these things so that we actually see the results of the model instead of the previous one. And we'll type it correctly, HS. So now if I run this, what this should show is um, for every one point increase in your, G in your high school GPA, so moving from a two to a three, that is on average going to boost your freshman GPA by 0.7. Um, so it's going to move it from a 3 to a 3.7 or, or something like that. But that's the effect that we have with the high school GPA. We can check to see if that's significant. If we come over to the p-value, um, this says 6.9, but that's not actually correct because it has this uh, scientific notation, which means move the decimal point 78 places this way. Um, so it's going to be 0. 0. 0.00000077 times 693. So that is very significant, um, definitely not zero. Um, so that's our effect if we just do high school GPA. Um, we have a couple other final models here. So right now we've just been using individual um, variables to explain the variation in, in freshman GPA. Um, so we've looked at high school GPA, we've looked at SAT scores um, disaggregated by verbal and math, and we've looked at SAT scores just by themselves. Um, but now, because we can do multiple regression, we can see what the effect of all of these things at the same time is. Um, do a simultaneous regression model. So to do that, we'll come to this section. It says, explain college GPA using SAT score and sex. So we'll just copy our chunk here. Come down to here. Um, we'll name this model um, SAT underscore sex. Um, so GPA freshman year is explained by SAT total. Is that what the column is? Yep, SAT total plus sex. And then we want to show the results from those. We'll replace the tidy and glance object there. So now if I run this chunk, we should see a regression that has SAT score and has the male coefficient. So what this means, if we go back to the slider and the switch example, if we hold everything constant, um, as you increase your SAT score um, by one point, then your GPA is going to go up by 0.02. Um, this coefficient, though, does not get interpreted the same way. This is a switch, not a slider. So what this means is currently you notice how female is not in this list. That is the base case. Everything is based on female. Um, this is the switch that says this is the effect for being male. And so according to this, being male is associated with a 0.27 lower GPA. Um, so if you took identical people, one is male, one is female, on average, the male is going to have like a, um, the, the, the woman's going to have like a 3.5 and the, the man is going to have like a 3.2-ish, 3.23. It's going to be lower by 0.27 points on average. And if we check the p-value there, that should be very significant. It's definitely not zero. Um, so that is kind of a sizable, observable effect there that um, men have worse freshman GPAs than women. Um, so we got that from our regression results here. Um, finally, we're going to do what is called the kitchen sink model, where we're going to include everything at the same time. We're going to do SAT scores, high school GPA, and sex, all to explain your freshman GPA in college. So to do that, we'll just copy the same chunk and paste it down here. We're going to call this model everything. 
So this is going to be freshman GPA explained by, just for fun, we'll do both kinds of SAT scores. We're gonna say SAT verbal plus SAT math plus um, high school GPA, I can't remember the name of that column, GPA underscore HS, GPA underscore HS plus sex. Um, if you notice on my screen, this line is kind of getting long. It automatically wraps this data line onto the next line. Um, that's okay. Um, best practice, though, is when the lines get kind of long um, to add line breaks to, to break it up a little bit. So if I press enter right before data here, it will put data on the next line, and that's fine. You can have line breaks inside functions like that. That's, that's great. I could even hit enter um, before one of those, and it's going to indent it differently here. Um, so that, that helps it fit better on the screen. If you happen to mess something up, like if the indentation somehow ends up like this and that looks bad, it'll still run, but that looks funny. Um, you can either hit space a whole bunch of times to get everything to line up, but that's awful. Um, instead, you can select this code here. Um, you don't need to select everything. You just need to have some part of that line selected of all the lines here. And on a Mac, if you press Command-I, or on Windows, if you press Control I, it will re-indent everything and make everything nice and aligned how it should be, which is nice. Um, so here's our model everything. We're gonna copy that and we'll show the results of model everything. So if we run it now, here is our results. So we can interpret all of these things now if we wanted. We could say um, holding everything constant, a one point increase in your verbal SAT score is associated with a 0.016 higher GPA. Holding everything constant, a one point increase in your math SAT score is going to be associated with a 0.015 point increase in GPA. So those are very, very tiny. Your SAT score is not really influencing your um, freshman GPA at all. High school GPA, for every one point increase in your high school GPA, your freshman GPA is going to go, is has is associated with a 0.5 point higher um, average. Um, and then finally, this, um, the categorical variable, um, so being male is associated with a 0.14 point decrease in your GPA. So on average, men have lower freshman GPAs than women after controlling for SAT scores and high school GPA and everything else. We can look at some of the model diagnostics here. We can look at the R squared. So all of these variables combined explain 36% of the variation in freshman GPA, which isn't everything. Um, that's probably not the greatest model in the world, but it, it works, I guess. Okay, so if we want to answer this last question, which model best predicts freshman GPA and how do you know? Um, there's lots of different ways of comparing how predictive a model is. One super naive way, which isn't the best, but it, it makes more conceptual sense is to compare the R squareds across the different models. Um, you can also compare this AIC value or the BIC value, and that's kind of more in the machine learning prediction world. Um, so just for the sake of simplicity, we'll look at R squared. Um, we could go through and look at R squared for each of these models and write it down somewhere and figure out what they are, but that gets really tedious. So instead, I want to have all of these R squareds and all of the coefficients and all of the model details in one place, in one table, all together, which will make interpreting these things a lot easier. So to do that, there's actually a really fun function. Um, we'll insert a new chunk here. The function is called model summary. And it is inside a package called model summary. Um, so it's not built into R automatically. So we need to come back up to the top of the document where we load our libraries. We're going to load a new library called model summary. And if we run this chunk now, so that's loading tidyverse, which is the ggplot stuff and the dplyr stuff like group by and summarize and mutate, broom, which has tidy and glance, and then model summary, which has model summary. So if we come down to the bottom, we're going to use um, this model summary function. The way it works is we feed it a list of models, and then it will put all of the model details in a table with each model as its own column. Um, so we need to feed it a list. There's actually a function in R called list. 
that lets us make a list of the different models we want to feed it. So here's where we can scroll up and see what the names of our models were. We had, our first one was called Model Simple. Then we had um, Model SAT. So let's write those down because I'm remembering them. So we had Model underscore Simple. We had Model underscore SAT. Um, the next one we ran came after Model SAT called, um, so there's Model SAT, Model HS for high school, the Model HS, Model SAT sex. So we want Model underscore HS, Model underscore SAT sex. And the last model we ran was Model Everything. We're going to put all five together simultaneously. So model everything. Um, this line is getting long. So I, again, I can kind of add some line breaks in here to break it up and make it better. If I run this chunk now, it should show five models all at the same time. So cool. OK, so those are the different coefficients for the models. And so you can see the effect of SAT total across these different model specifications, SAT math scores across different specifications, high school GPA across different specifications, um, sex across the different specifications. If you scroll down a little bit more, it shows you the R squared and the adjusted R squared for each of the models. So you can see it's generally in the 0.2 range until you get to the everything model, and then it ex it's explaining 36% of the variation. Neat. Um, with AIC scores, those in general, the lower it is, the better it is. Um, and BIC2, the lower it is, the better it is. And so, neat. Um, there's all of the model results all at the same time. So if I save this document, um, right now everything is just stored, all of this text is stored in, a, in this RMD file, which is just a text file. These pictures don't actually exist um, in the RMD file. If I open this in a text editor, it would just have all of the text. So if we want all of the results and code and output and everything in the same document, that's where we're going to knit. So if I click on the knit button, it should run all of the chunks individually. So it's going to go through and run from the beginning. The nice thing about this is if you did any data cleaning, like filtering or adding new columns, it's going to do that again. So every time you knit, it's as if you open R fresh and you haven't loaded any data. So you're starting from the beginning. It's very reproducible. Um, has all of the steps to recreate all of the models and pictures. And so now it's done. And it should show up with this finished HTML file that looks like that. OK, so at the top, we have this nice table of contents. Um, we can scroll down. We can see our exploratory pictures and the correlation values. If we scroll down a little bit more, we can get to the actual models. Here's our nice list that we made, where x equals SAT scores, y equals freshman GPA. If this was a real document, we would like have a paragraph explaining stuff. We could have more paragraphs explaining other stuff later. Um, here's the results right in the document. Here's the R squared right in the document. Here's the picture. Um, here's all of the other models with their results all there. And if you come to the very bottom, we should have a cool table with all of the models side by side together. And it's neat. And that is how you do regression stuff. Um, this is an HTML file. We can knit it as PDF or knit it as Word, and it'll also show up. This, it'll show the same results and output and everything else. So that is how you run regressions and correlations with R. Um, hopefully that was fun, and um, this should be a good example to work with for your problem set.